In the name of Jesus, amen. You want action and adventure, blood and gore, danger and deception? Turn off Game of Thrones and open up the Old Testament. Guys, you want to read about some serious biblical hotties? Try J.L., the lady who killed the Canaanite army commander Sisera by driving a tent peg through his head. And then, of course, there's Esther, who has an entire book devoted to her story, a book in the Bible that doesn't even mention God. She's definitely at the top of the list of Old Testament hotties. She was chosen as a new queen for the king of Persia. I'm not going to mention his name because it's way too hard to pronounce. After he gave the old queen the boot for publicly shaming him by not heeding his command to show her face at his big party. And so the king's young men said, let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king. And so we meet Esther, a Jew, there in the Persian Empire because of the exile when King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon carried away a bunch of the Jews from Jerusalem. It was the Lord's judgment over the idolatry and godlessness of his own people. Read Jeremiah 25. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not obeyed my words, behold, I will send for all the tribes of the north, declares the Lord, and for Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all these surrounding nations. I will devote them to destruction and make them a horror, a hissing, and an everlasting desolation. It shouldn't be a surprise to us then that when we encounter the young, beautiful Jewish virgin Esther, a plot arises among one of the king's men to wipe out the Jews. The king had no idea his new queen was one of them. Who cares? She's hot, he thinks. Well, Esther was called upon to take a stand for her people. She needed an audience with the king to reveal the plot against her people. But it was forbidden, forbidden to go to the king in the inner court without having been called. The penalty, death. But to not go to the king and take a stand in behalf of her people would have meant annihilation for the Jews. And so Esther put on her royal robes and her makeup and went and stood in the king's inner court. And she won his favor. He reached out to her with the golden scepter in his hand, which meant she would live. He accepted her and would listen. He promised to grant her wish, which later she reveals is to save her people. And so Esther took a stand, risking even death to save a dying people. Now what we should realize is that the Jews were already under God's judgment. They were already history. Sure, God had promised a return from exile and the restoration of Jerusalem, the holy city, but God's judgment is bigger than Jerusalem and the Jews. The whole world is under judgment. Did you hear Romans 8? For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. That's the Lord. His judgment over sin, even your sin, your thoughts, your words, your deeds, your idolatry, your failure to obey God's words, to stand for him and his will, to stick your neck out for others. All of these things are part of what's wrong with this world, a world subject by God to judgment, 
decay, destruction, because of humanity's sin. This is a world where an entire race is brought to the point of extinction, and yet it's so much bigger than that. Paul says the entire creation is in bondage to corruption. That's our exile. And in that bondage, you and I are much like that stubborn queen who refused to heed the king's command. But God, in his mercy, chose not to give you the boot. Esther took a stand for a dying people, and God himself has taken a stand for you. People already dead in trespasses and sins. The king of kings laid aside his royal robe and exchanged it for human flesh. He put down that golden scepter and took up a cross of wood. God, in the person of his son, came into this world, subjected himself to its bondage and corruption, and not only risked his life, but gave it up for you to bring you back from death, to give you hope in the midst of this suffering and dying world. Jesus took his stand and died for you and rose for you. He won God's favor for you by his perfect life and death. He embraced his own suffering and death, looking to the glory to come, the glory of his own resurrection, but also your resurrection, the revealing of the sons of God, your adoption, the redemption of your body, and the restoration of all creation. God worked through Esther to save his people, but he's always up to something far bigger than what you can see. As he raised up Esther, God was working this greater salvation, salvation for you, salvation for the world. God's people are never really without hope in this life. God's children are always looking ahead. The sons of God stand and confess as we do in the Nicene Creed. I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. In Romans, Paul takes his Christian hearers on a journey through the reality, the gravity of sin, the cost of redemption, the new life in Christ through baptism the daily struggle that the new man in Christ has against the flesh of the old Adam, then the suffering endured while being who we are in the midst of this decaying, dying world. And that's where you are, dear Christian, in a fallen world, groaning in the pains of childbirth, living in real hope, waiting for the consummation of salvation on the last day, full, complete, Real, physical, new life is on the way. But the king has given you his royal robe so that you can be in his presence even now and live. He has adopted you as his own into his family, into his body. That's your baptism, where you also receive the spirit who is at work in you with groans too deep for words. Your baptism always looks ahead to the redemption of your body, your resurrection. You see, salvation is about more than the Jewish people, more than ethnicity, but it is very much about flesh and blood. God entered into the flesh to redeem your flesh, to redeem your body for the life to come. A physical creation, recreation free from the bondage to sin and death. Our Lord even gives you his own flesh and blood to feed you and sustain you, to sustain this new life in the here and now as he invites you into his presence at his table in the sacrament, to his feast, his big party. He summons and calls you a foretaste of what is to come. And as you look to that life to come, you now live not in the flesh, that is the sinful flesh, but in the Spirit who gives you life in Jesus. You go forth desiring to do what the King commands, loving what He's promised, serving your neighbor with love and mercy, standing and confessing our Lord Jesus in word and deed. 
You can do that even in the face of death. And that means that in Christ, you are a true hottie. In the name of Jesus, amen.